join us. Hey everyone watching, I'm Paul Goodman here with Katie Carrero and Rob Rosado. We are at the Carriage House Art Center in Norwalk, Connecticut, which is presenting Evil Dead the Musical uh, October 20th through October 28th. <laughs> Uh, and that's going to be Fridays and Saturdays, and also Thursday, October 26th. All shows are going to be at 8 p.m. Tickets go on sale September 15th. You can find out more at carriagehouseartcenter.org. And so in honor of this cult classic, Evil Dead, we're celebrating horror. And uh, we have the director of the show, Katie Carrero, and we have Rob Rosado, a horror movie feature reviewer. Uh, who writes at RobbieHorror.com. So, thanks to both of you for coming along. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so to start off, could each of you talk about why you love horror movies? Uh, <laughs> let's see, I think, let's see, it kind of started when I was a kid, and my, my cousins were mostly older, um, throughout the 80s and the early 90s, they were watching films that I later recognized as, you know, Child's Play 2, Freddy 5, Texas Chainsaw 3, um, all the, you know, Halloween 6 or whatever, and I started catching glimpses of them, but it was with Scream in 96 that really, you know, I didn't know if, what they were talking about in terms of tropes or cliches. I didn't see enough to, uh, to really understand what that even meant, but I knew that it, it made me feel something, and it made me feel exhilarated, and I was scared, and I, was, and I, I enjoy being scared for some reason. I'm a big prankster, I'm not going to pull anything today, um, but I think it's because... You know, other than comedy, it's the only genre of film that it, a reaction from the audience is mandatory, and that's its really primary goal. But unlike comedy, a bad horror film can still be enjoyable. A bad comedy is, is torture, but um, even a bad horror film still has that momentum, that, that kind of desire to get you to feel something. Um, and I just I love being scared. It, within reason, like as long as a safe, fun environment. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, yeah, so I, for me too, uh, when I was young, my dad used to think that we were asleep and he would put on like a horror film and um, I would wake up and start watching them and it's something that we ended up bonding over. Like he would recommend me Stephen King books that he was reading and we'd have sleep, you know, sleepovers at my dad's house and we'd wait for my, my little sister to go to bed and we'd like watch the horror movie we rented. Um, and yeah, I just have loved it ever since. And I also love being scared in a fun, safe environment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Roller coasters, books, film. Yeah. Thrill awesome. seeker. Type. Yeah. Haunted. Do you like haunts? Yeah. Like Halloween? Yes. Stuff? Yeah, love it. Oh my God. There's one in Shelton. That's Was that, so um, good. no, that's one. Is it, uh, Legends of Fear? Yes. yes. Have you I mean, done it? Yeah. The animatronics that they have? Yes. This is not an ad for Shelton. <laughs> <Shelton's laughs> <Shelton's laughs> but also, Legends no. Legends of Fear and Shelton. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> um, there was a nun, like, on a, like, yes. some sort of a springboard. She, like, launches out of you. Like, I was so not expecting it. Oh, my God. So good. But, yeah, check that one out. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> And also comes the Evil Dead. Yes. Yeah. yes. Well, speaking of which, before you do that, speaking, speaking of which, I mean, like, Katie, uh, what do you love about Evil Dead? What do I love about Evil Dead? Yeah. Um, I love cheesy campy horror. I'm a big Sam Raimi fan. Um, grew up loving Cena Warrior Princess, um, Girl Power, and Bruce Campbell makes an appearance. But um, I love the, the cheesiness of it. This musical is hilarious because it's in a perfect homage to Sam Raimi's work, but with that fun musical in ice on space twist. Mm. So, yeah. Rob, do you love Sam Raimi as much? Um, let's see. I don't have the quite the reverence that a lot of other people do, but it's not by for by lack of respect. He's an incredible, innovative uh, filmmaker. He did this when he was in his early twenties on a shoestring budget of what did you say it was ten k or something like that? Um, and through sheer force of vision and energy and enthusiasm and technique, he turned a very simple plot into an iconic film that Stephen King back in the day was, was raving about. Uh, filmmakers like Edgar Wright and Tarantino and Eli Roth all have stated, and I'm sure many, many more, have stated that Evil Dead is a primary influence and an inspiration for them. So there's something to it. I, I love Evil Dead 2 for sure. Army of Darkness I haven't seen in a long time, but I actually really enjoyed the two most recent entries, which were 2013 and then Evil Dead Rise earlier this year, because it took that same kind of unhinged camp factor, mm -hmm. and I think they both had a, an undercurrent of emotion to them. Mm -hmm. The characters were a little bit more fleshed out, um, but the Evil Dead, the original, is still one of those 
you know, it's a classic midnight movie. It doesn't ask much of you, but what, as soon as you start, you can't turn it off because it's just pummeling you with blood and imagery yeah. and swooping cameras and sound effects. And it's, it's really, it's really something. The TV show too was good. Um, yes. Mask versus Evil Dead. Did you watch that? Was, that? that was incredible too. Oh yeah. my god, I yeah. loved it. I I love revivals like that. Like I love um, the original Twin Peaks, but mm -hmm. the the revival where David Lynch got so much more involved in like the actual. Yes. Incredible. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I also like to add one more thing about yeah. Sam Raimi. Yeah. Like I love that he works with the same actors all the time. Like he has you know his his buddy from high school, Bruce Campbell, mm -hmm. but also his brother Ted. Uh, Ted Raimi and Lucy Lawless, like he he reuses them when when appropriate, and I love that. It's just like a he nice. He gave us Bruce Campbell, like he gave us Bruce for Campbell. that alone. Yes. We must we must bet it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Have you got have, have there ever have there ever been um, have you guys ever thought like in your spare time uh, have there other other movies that or I mean hell whatever comes to you right now like are, can you think of other movies that would be funny. To like musicalize. Hmm. Um, have you ever seen Rubber? Yeah, uh, <laughs> with the tire. Yeah. I have not since it came out in 06. Yeah, same. But that's the first thing that, that was. was I need to. <laughs> I need to watch it again. Um, but I remember just being just I remember very waiting strange. for it to come out with my friends in oh. college, and we're like, we are going to watch this <laughs> the second it comes out. Um, it's about a tire that goes on a killing spree, so yeah. uh, that could be good. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> and I think it's played relatively straight, right? I think so. Yeah. I think that's like the brilliance of it. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'd have to think, but... Um, I think that uh, The Shining became an opera. Oh god, oh. I did not know that. I think it became an opera yeah. recently. It premiered like somewhere in the Pacific Northwest or something like that. Um, huh. But it's, I don't think it's made it to over here, but, you know, Carrie was also a very famous, infamous musical that I think went through a revision re uh, within the past decade or two, and, because it was not well received initially, uh, but I think it's come back in a couple of more well-regarded productions. Um, I've, the music's good, it, it's just, you know, horror and music, it's a, it's difficult to reconcile, but with Evil Dead, yeah. I have not seen the musical. My understanding is it really embraces the kind of camp, high energy oh, yeah. uh, factor, and just kind of is it more rock music? How would you describe the score? I would say like eighties hair band Amazing. music for the most part. Yeah. I think that's what it's trying to. Like in one song, out. like in one song, they reference uh, Meatloaf. Uh -huh. um, uh, yeah. Uh, so kind of like big epic choruses and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it's a mix between that and then, you know, the opening song's very cheesy. There's kind of like a tango number. There's also a nod to the time warp at some point in there. Um, yeah, if you like if you like Rocky Heart, anyone watching this, uh, you'll, doesn't? you'll probably like Evil Dead for sure. Like, it's definitely the same, like, vibe, right? Like, yeah, I, I think it's supposed to be like, um, you know how Stephen King does those, like, the books that very, they touch on one page, but they're considered like sister books. Yeah. This is like the same thing, like they touch on that one line, but it's supposed to be that they're like a little bit sisters, like they're a nod huh. to each other mm -hmm. in a way. Obviously, not a nod to each other. Rocky came away before Evil Dead the Musical, but there's a clear nod to that whole vibe. I get that. In the writing of the, the score. And are you guys, you're doing a splatter zone. Oh yeah. Yes. Blood. We're gonna get, be giving away um, ponchos with tickets, so. And little wet wipes. And for the first people that show up, um, you, if the kits. So they're on sale. Uh -huh. We're going to have 20, 20 um, props kits for sale for every performance. Um, it, I can't tell you what's in them, but okay. it'll be fun. And slightly We can't, give, we can't give everything away. <laughs> yeah, we can't right. give everything away here. But it, it'll be six bucks. There'll be 20 available each night, first come, first serve. And they're just like a little extra bounce of fun to your night. Yeah. Rob and I were talking earlier, um, uh, did you ever, th I saw, uh, an It parody musical that, like, it, like, started in L.A., came to New York, and it was, like, all, like, 80s songs, like, real songs that were, like, not written for the musical. I was just curious if you had, if you had heard or seen that. I know it went viral online, um, Is it on Broadway? Uh, it was like touring like small clubs. It never they were not Broadway. I'm sure the actors were being paid something, but like, uh, but yeah. I haven't even heard of this. Okay, no, me neither. No. no worries. But I love. Um, I mean, I love the original TV series It, but I loved the first It 
Not that I didn't love it part two, oh, like the yeah. remake. Yeah. Did you like it? Not part two. No, not so much. <laughs> no me neither. Not part yeah. two, but oh, part, part one. one yeah. I thought was I love the score. I thought the score was so good. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, ben S Wall. Ben, yes. Yeah. yeah. Very very skilled. Uh, I mean, let's see. I have I go back and forth because I think that part two uh, or not part two, the remake part one um, had better production value because it was made you know a great deal right. later. But the original had. Tim, Tim Curry, Curry. I know. and I think it trusted yeah. it. It was less explicit than the um, than the remake, and I, right. I I go back and forth on which one I find better. I think they're really good companion pieces, very much a product of their time. One of them was yeah, sure. a '90s, like early early '90s miniseries. The other one was big budget. Yeah, I know. Studio. And they both had great Pennywises too. Yeah, and I what I really liked about the new version, the remake, um, was the, the human monsters and the focus on that. Mm. And the, I thought that made it really scary. And like, I thought that was more of a, a the TV series is great too, but like, I liked the, I think that that's what Stephen King does well is those like human monsters. Mm. So I liked that they kind of focused on that. They definitely lot. illustrated that much better in the remake. The yeah. idea that dairy somehow corrupts the adults uh, to the point where they don't see Children yeah. going missing and children being bullied and whatnot. Right. Yeah. You know, they, they, it's, it's like a blinder onto them. Hmm. Yeah, and then they have they manifest their own problems in themselves, like the hoarder mm -hmm. parent or the um, the abuser parent yeah. and things like that. And I thought it was done mm -hmm. well. I would love to see that musical though. It, All right. If the musical. If anyone's watching this and is looking for a musical for a horror movie to turn into a musical, uh, uh. Uh, we could do it. Uh, obviously, there's been one that I was referring to earlier, but we could do another one. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, so, like, I, like I, these two are the two horror fanatics in the room. I'm not quite one, but I mean, I just want to curious for as two horror fanatics, um, as someone who like may be turned off by the idea of like, oh, it's horror. Like, what's your pitch to them to see this show? Oh well. If you're if you don't like being scared, I wouldn't worry. This isn't a scary show. It's definitely a campy, silly, cheesy, very fun, high energy show with lots of blood and a talking moose. It's just But done in a fun. funny way. Yeah, but, funny, silly musical. Yeah. Um, but perfect for Halloween because it just it fits that genre and that, that vibe. It's got Halloween vibes, but it's not scary. It's fun. Katie, I know you've done this show before. What was your role the last time you did it? Oh, I was, um, I played Linda 10 years ago in State College, Pennsylvania. So, I, we have our... Yeah, I was wondering, like, should we, we refer State to College that? Fun, yeah, uh, <laughs> chainsaw that we used. So, thanks to my friends um, who directed the, that 10 years ago who still had this. So, awesome. Do you want to talk about the chainsaw more or just, like, let it be... Like, it's a surprise. Okay, right. It's a fun chainsaw surprise. <laughs> <laughs> the best kind of surprise. The Texas chainsaw surprise. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, I I'm I'm curious more, you know, about your podcast and like what what like what um not podcast. I'm sorry, your your blog. Sure. And what what do you select as like a film to review? Um, let's see. There, it's twofold. Um, it's either films that are considered classics, Friday the 13th, uh, Psycho, The Shining, Jaws, even like lesser known ones like The Burning. Um, just films that are well regarded or highly regarded or considered classics and just kind of deconstruct them from a critical standpoint from now. So even if they're well regarded, you know, what do I think of it and does it still hold up? Why or why not? And um, you know, with Friday the Thirteenth, I commended what it did, what was what it was for ahead of its time. But I'm also talking about maybe weaknesses in the direction. Sleepaway Camp's another one that is very famous for a couple of reasons. If you haven't seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but just kind of talking about it from a critical standpoint. Um, how does it has it aged well? Um, if you take the film on its own terms, separate from its classic status. What, what is it? Like, how does it hold up? Um, one film that I haven't uh, reviewed yet, uh, well, two, are Halloween and Scream, just they're my favorites, and I just, uh, how do I even begin broaching those topics? Um, but also, I review films that are new and coming out on streaming or the theater. So if I see something that I feel compelled to write about, it really comes to me the night that I've seen it. 
I'll be asleep and I'll wake up and be like, all right, I'm grabbing my computer or whatever, just jotting down thoughts. And then I post it and, um, you know, people disagree or they might agree, but, um, you know, it's a good, it's kind of like a letterboxed yeah. thing, but it's more, uh, you know, more, I guess, front facing and, you know, uh, I just love talking to people about new, exposing them to potentially films like, uh, Talk To Me, which just dropped on streaming with Santa the Bone Woman that's now on Shudder, films that they might not have even heard of, yeah. but for one reason or another, I feel like they should check out. Yeah. Did you see Tusk? Yes. Did you? I, I'm curious. I it wasn't for <laughs> me, but I, I'm curious. What uh, uh, mm -hmm. it was an interesting <laughs> film. It was an interesting creative, you know, because Kevin Smith had just done Red State, which is more like a grungy, um, kind of religious guns and you know, stalking kind of a thriller. This one was creature feature, basically. Yeah. I don't know. I still don't know what I thought about it. It was well done. Yeah. And it was well acted for the most part, but um, I wasn't quite sure what the tone was going for. Just when I thought I understood the tone. Right. It kind of so, flips. It kind of flips up and Johnny Depp shows up in a long scene that I just didn't know what to do with. Yeah. So it just, it kind of upended my expectations in a way that I wasn't crazy about, you know? I, I know I should have known what to expect going in because of the title and the, you know, the, the poster, but I still didn't believe that it was going to be what it became. I, yeah. I couldn't believe it, and then I was like, oh, I should have It was pretty expected. creepy in the, in, like, when, um, when you're first introduced yeah. to Michael Parks' character. Right. He's describing his relationship with a walrus, and Justin Long's character is a podcaster, I believe, and they're just getting to know each other. It's a very bizarre and really well done scene. Mm -hmm. It's when things go further into some sort of camp territory that if it lost me a little bit. Yeah, you know? I know, me too. I... Would you, is there a good camp versus a bad camp horror movie? Yeah, I think... Uh, no, go ahead. No, I think that um, good camp is when the actors on screen and the filmmakers behind it are everyone's doing their earnest to make a very serious film. And I think a great example is Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Um, every, and it's a fantastic movie with excellent performances. It just so happens that it's the... There's something about the tone and the fact that it involves two kind of aging female uh, vaudeville stars and the other one's a movie star. Uh, there's something campy about it. It can't be, it's very intangible, um, yeah. but it's more of a tone and kind of like Mommy Dearest is arguably good camp, although there's, um, well, I don't, how, how would you define it? No, I mean, I, I think there's different, I think that's a very good description. I think there are some campy films that I think are still enjoyable, even though everyone's in on the the joke. Like I like I said, I love um, Bride of Chucky, but mm. I just I love the soundtrack. I think the soundtrack's brilliant. I think Jennifer Dilly's really hot, mm -hmm. um, and I just it's fun. Like mm. that movie is fun to watch, but at the same time, there are films that become campy just because everyone's fully committed, even though. Yeah. And and that can that can be a whole different genre too. Fully committed, but the script just isn't there. There's this film. Have you heard of this film called A Talking Cat? No. It is. Everyone there is so earnest, and it is the worst script of all time. But it's fun to watch because it's called A Talking Cat. That's really. That's really good to say. Have you seen yeah. Troll Two? No. Okay. Is this the one where there's actually no Troll One? There's no Troll One. There's no. Trolls. I've heard about this. There's no trolls in Troll Two, by the way. They're goblins. That's beside <laughs> the point. Everyone who's on screen is taking it very seriously. They're playing it as if it's Shakespeare in the Park, but the plot and the trappings that are around them are utterly ridiculous. They're paper mache masks, uh, blood that's literally green paint. Yeah. yeah. It's just nothing about it deserves to be taken seriously, but the people on screen are taking it seriously. But, you're, but you raise a good point. There is a way to, to make calculated camp. American Horror Stories, you know, anything that Ryan Murphy does is mm -hmm. more or less really it's calculated camp and yeah. Chucky. In yeah. fact, the latter in the Chucky TV series, for instance. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. There's yeah. yeah. There's different types of camp, but it's all about a, a, a heightened, borderline comedic tone. Yeah. And I think for yeah. horror, you know, I think I can't remember who said this, but you know, the vast majority of great horror films are just one step short of being ridiculous. Yeah. And you kind of have to kind of give your 
as a filmmaker or an actor, it's all about going to the edge and seeing how far mm -hmm. you can go without, without falling over. Yeah, I like that yeah. description. Um, I have one more I want to ask yeah. you about because it popped in my head. Yeah. Old Boy, the Korean, Korean one. You're bringing up films that are, that are very, I never really would have, would have considered them more, but they, they are though. Yeah. Old Boy, I it's guess it's more psychological up. thriller. But no, it, but you're right though. Like these are films that are kind of because horror. That's another thing that's great it's about. It's such like a yeah. It's a vast umbrella of different subgenres. There, right. more subgenres than any other genre. Period. Exactly. There's you know yeah. all type. There's westerns. There's you know sci-fi Slasher, horror. Slasher, monster, e exactly. psychological, musical, human, comedy, yeah, musical horror yeah. films. <laughs> uh, certainly many comedic horror films. Uh, old boy. Oh man, it's a brilliant film. It's it's tough as nails, and I'll never watch it again. Oh god, I, my boyfriend feels the same way. I love it. <laughs> I love watching people watch it for yeah. the first time. It is so disturbing. If I watch it, it'll take me six. I'll, it'll be in my brain for like six months and just yeah. like gets oh. you. I know it's so messed up. I I wiki it. I don't know this movie, but I'm caught up in this like. like you need to watch well, it. there was a remake of it. <laughs> it. A spike. I no, it's no. It's Spike Lee did a remake of it. Spike Lee, wow. With like Josh Brolin, and it it takes a lot of the same steps, but it just does not have the lasting impact, and it doesn't go as far as to yeah. the to the point where it doesn't go as far as the other one did. I think a part of it's cultural too, because we don't have that same, you know, the relationship in that film is a lot. A lot of that relationship is very specific, I think, to that part of the mm -hmm. world, and so here, I don't think it slaps as hard. It's true. I mean, there's a filmmaker called, I think I believe his name is Yoko Anwar. He is an Indonesian film, I be filmmaker, I believe. He did a couple of films called um, Satan Slaves in Pedagore. Um, and I think there's a couple more there too. But he is a new up and coming filmmaker who is straddling that line between uh, his culture and also Americanized, uh, westernized horror. So Satan Slaves could easily be alongside The Conjuring and Pedagore could easily be alongside <clears throat> um, some other kind of occult horror films um, because he's marrying the two sensibilities together. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, those are two horror yeah. stories. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I need to get some, like, recommendations from you. Yep. I go on Reddit to get recommendations because, like, I don't, I don't have a lot of people in my life that like horror. I have to end up watching them myself. So I go to Reddit to get recommendations, but I'm going to start getting my, my recs from you. Well, after uh, this, we'll get some more fr uh, horror friends. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, just tying back to the camp conversation, like where, uh, and it's, I, I love the in-depth conversation about, about camp. I mean, where does, in the spectrum that you guys talked about, where does uh, Evil Dead fit with that? About like good camp, bad camp, that kind of whole thing. I mean, I would say it falls in that you know, I, I think that, especially in the first film, so I think yeah. it's an evolving, uh, Evil Dead's very evolving, right? But I think that that very first film was, like, sincere acting yes. there, you know, and um, and then it, it devolves into ridiculousness, especially with Army of Darkness. That's where it yeah. becomes that cheesy, like, check out my boomstick <laughs> kind of cheesy lines that, like, Ash had to grow as a character um, into that, what people know him as, but in the first it's film, it's, he's really not there. He really doesn't say a lot. Like really, he said, it's very he's cool. very straight faced. He's very stalwart. Yeah. He's a strong male lead, but he is not the kind of you know one liner dropping, yeah. you know, kind of David Caruso level of uh, you know sunglasses and says right. something before he blows away a demon. Um, we're not there yet. That's like Evil Dead Two, but especially Army of Darkness, and then more to the point, um, Ash versus Evil Dead. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, um, that's where it's like. Now we know what this is, and yeah. like we know what the people like, and groovy, and all that. Give me some sugar, baby. Yeah, kind of yeah. Stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna get some. some. Yeah. <laughs> all, yeah. Those, all those yeah. iconic lines. Yeah, that that TV series, that reboot was done so well. I thought it was like just creepy enough. Like it brought in like the, I guess it's CGI. I don't really know much mm -hmm. about how. They're probably it's CGI. Only, but, um, it was in one episode. That's probably CGI. Like I love, I love. That's what I love about The Exorcist. Actually, like I normally don't love CGI. Like The Exorcist still scares me because of those old style um, effects like mm -hmm. really freaked me out. But I did love Ash vs Evil Dead because I thought they did it really well. Like they yeah. kind of hit the balance of not too much, but creepier than the original. I think film. that's how we have to do it nowadays. There's yeah. you had mentioned before uh, the thing, which is. John Carpenter's thing, which is a masterpiece of practical effects, as is the Exorcist. They're both very forward-thinking, and they still, especially the thing they hold up 
yeah. brilliantly. Like the thing, I can't, I still can't see strings or anything like that. Um, but uh, you know, they did a prequel to the thing, which um, it was in 2011. It wasn't, you know, it left theaters pretty quickly for a reason. But the problem was they filmed all of it practically and then painted over with CGI. Mm. And so what we were left with was a film that, had, you know, aged badly within a month. Mm. You know, but if they just stuck to their guns and did practical, maybe some accent of CGI okay. to kind of make it to kind of fill out the, the uh, visuals, um, it might have fared better. Yeah. You, know, you can't you can't compete with the original unless you're going to do the same kind of innovative effects. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I mean, what's great about you know the thing too is again tying back to not necessarily the monster or anything that you see because you don't, but the the relationships and the people turning on each other and. Apple and they have nowhere to go. Right. So good. Oh, really fun. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, we, we were talking about, um, you know, what are your, what would you say are some of your favorite horror films? To you. Oh, me. Yeah, to you. Me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so I, I do love The Exorcist because I, a director's uncut version, because I think it was the first movie that really, like, shook me as a kid. Um, and that I like snuck away to watch because I knew it wasn't allowed to, so I just have an affinity for it. But also, it's just there's so much depth behind it. You can look, look and see like, oh, it's just this little this girl whose head turns around. But there's like a real story there behind the horror, and I love that. Um, different levels, religion, and and all of that. Um, and I love. Oh God, it's really hard to choose your favorite mm. horror movies. I would say that's number one. Um, I love Bride of Chucky just because it's it's cheesy and I love um, I love Asian horror because I think they do it so well and those are the movies that really scare me like Tale of Two Sisters mm. um, which we had kind of talked about earlier um, and you said you've seen that one right oh yeah yeah, yeah. that's a great movie I think they even on um, the Ring the original mm -hmm. Ring um, Japan does those films so well I think Korea does those films so well they really get they really get the psychological aspect of stuff and I feel like a lot of movies here maybe skim over that or miss it yeah they don't trust the audience's patience or intelligence I think yeah but the best ones do but um, by Asian that's just their sensibility when it comes to filmmaking they really take their time and they don't give you all the answers right they don't fill in every blank for you yeah, that's probably the biggest difference between like Eastern filmmaking and West. We have to give the audience everything because we, we dumb it down to the lowest common denominator a lot of the time. Um, that's true. And when you start, when you over explain what's scary, <laughs> right. you've shined a light on it and it's no longer yeah. terrifying anymore. If you leave just enough for your mind to fill it in, that's what keeps you up at night. It's those things where you're just like, oh my God, thing, you know, twists that occur to you later on or just mm -hmm. visuals that that sneak up on you on like the third rewatch, like, oh my god, I never noticed that, yeah. that person in the background. Right. That kind of thing. I know, or even, um, you know, with Burning, or the Burning, I can't remember the English, Burning, um, I remember looking up, like, what the director's intention was, because he doesn't tell you, and it leaves you with this, like, eerie feeling. Nothing about the film is scary itself. There's no jump scares or anything, but it is, like, very psychologically just disturbing. Yeah. And leaves you with a question mark, and you're like, what was... You want to know what the intention is, but the director doesn't want you to ask him. He wants you to come up with it himself. I just don't say... I don't... I'm like, what, what does Reddit say? I'm like, what does Reddit think? I want to... Um, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Something else popped in my... Oh, um, Parasite. <sighs> Did you like it? Did you... Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. One, of the, one of the best films I've ever seen. It's actually my top ten of all time. You know, it's, it's, I'll never forget first seeing that, and just, it was with a packed house, which was shocking. Um, it was in Port Chester, and it was like packed house for a, a film with subtitles, can you imagine? Mm. Yeah, Because right. a lot of people just don't, they don't want to put in the effort. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for a film that's, what, nearly two and a half hours long? Yeah. It was a roller coaster, and especially halfway through, with something happened. Switch. There's a paradigm yes. shift of the plot, Amazing. and from then on, the entire audience was, you can feel them all shifting in their seats, anticipating certain things when a you know a plot thread pays off and you can feel everyone reacting to it i've not in a, like those kind of movie going experiences don't happen very often yeah. so when everyone's on the same page and you can feel everyone kind of becoming one entity in the audience that's pretty incredible and it's, and it's a great film that provokes those reactions it's it's uh, immaculate i would say 
he, that director um, did such a good job because he knew exactly how to tell that story, not just to a Korean audience. I lived in Korea for, for um, like eight years. Oh my God. Um, but also to tell it to an audience that might not get the cultural aspect of every cultural piece of the film, and he made it just broad enough that like we could understand it here, mm -hmm. and it became our what Oscar winning, winning film of the year, right? Yeah, yeah. deserved. Deserved. Yes, easily. Ugh. No other film was even even came close that year. And I think people, I have a few people friends who who won't see it or didn't like it. And you just didn't get it or you had this weird expectation coming in yeah. because like I get you know the the title of the film can be it's so suggestive but that's the brilliance of it um even I liked it oh my god and, uh, it's amazing like... it, yeah that that twist in the middle ter like terrified me in a very different way yeah it's it's not again not jump scare you but can't it's see disturbing it coming. No. you'll never see it coming oh, no. yeah. love it so good love Asian oh yeah Anything else for us? Um, well, um, uh, if you guys got nothing, uh, I mean, uh, we just want to say join us for Evil join Dead, the, <laughs> join us <laughs> for Evil <laughs> Dead, the musical, um, and thank you for watching, uh, this intro, uh, this conversation between the three of us, and thank you, Rob and Katie, for, for doing this, uh, pleasure, um, so please join us and see Evil Dead, the musical at the Carriage House Art Center in Norwalk, Connecticut, Friday's Friday what? Wear white. <laughs> Wear white. Um, we will provide ponchos in the splatter zone, but uh, but yes, wear white. Uh, but uh, anyway, so that's Evil Dead the Musical, uh, Carriage House Art Center, Norwalk, Connecticut, October 20th through 28th, and Thursday the 26th, um, but uh, also Fridays and Saturdays. Uh, all shows are at 8 p.m. Go to carriagehouseartcenter.org for more information. Tickets will go on sale September 15th. Um, you can follow Carriage House on Facebook and uh, Instagram at Carriage House Art Center. Rob, where can people find you? Uh, on Instagram, it's Robbie, R O B B Y underscore horror. And that's where you'll find just, you know, either posts about upcoming horror films or horror news. But mostly it's about just uh, little mini essays about horror films that, for one reason or another, I decided to blab on about that day. Katie, where can people find you? Uh, I don't post anything, but I should now because we're evil dead. So my, my Instagram is, oh God, I think it's at, I should have prepared this. I think it's at Here Lies Katie, K-A-T-I-E. Here Lies Katie as in my, my staff. Love it. Um, all right, everyone, thanks for watching. Bye.